In the 1950s, a whole host of psychotropic drugs, that is drugs that affect the mind, entered the medical scene. And these included antipsychotic drugs, antidepressants, tranquilizers, and hypnotics. And these discoveries were very exciting at the time as they seemed to promise a cure for schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, insomnia, and other afflictions. It was even hoped that all mental illness could be cured by a handful of pills and there would be no need for psychiatrists. And it was also believed by a sort of backwards knowledge, at logic, that the drugs would reveal the causes of mental illness. Antipsychotics block brain receptors for dopamine, therefore schizophrenia must be due to excess dopamine. Antidepressants increase the activity of serotonin, so depression must be due to lack of serotonin. And tranquilizers enhance the activity of GABA, so anxiety must be due to lack of GABA. But these naive and simple hopes were entirely false. Fifty years later, we still don't know the cause of schizophrenia, depression, or anxiety. The prognosis of these states has changed little, and the fact is that drugs do not cure any mental illness. They control some symptoms, but they do not affect the underlying process. The benzodiazepines like Xanax and Valium stop working after a time as tolerance develops and are addictive in the sense that you get withdrawal symptoms if you try to stop. So after some wrangling, the medical profession accepted officially in the 1980s on the grounds that they produced the withdrawal syndrome that benzodiazepine were dependence producing or addictive. So then the drug companies started a campaign to replace benzodiazepines with the new antidepressants, the SSRIs, such as Prozac, which were also heralded as good not only for depression, but also for pan panic, generalized anxiety, phobias, post-traumatic stress disorder, and OCD. And Prozac was so successful that drug companies vied to make cheaper Me Too SSRIs. So now we have at least six other SSRIs in addition to Prozac. But lo and behold, patients reported that SSRIs produced a withdrawal reaction too, which also included anxiety when they were stopped. And in a scramble to prove that SSRIs were not addictive, the American Psychiatric Association produced a new manual, DSM-4, which actually changed the definition of uh, drug dependence by adding a few more criteria. And they replaced the term, term withdrawal syndrome with the patronizing euphemism discontinuation reaction, as if patient would think there was some subtle difference between discontinuation and withdrawal. Well, apart from the indications dubiously approved by the American Psychiatric Association, which of course we follow in the UK, there's been a burgeoning of off-label prescriptions of psychotropic drugs. That is for indications um, which, for which they have never been approved or tested. And off-label prescriptions particularly affect children and the elderly. In 2002, four million children in the United States were prescribed antipsychotics and mood stabilizers, and another 2.2 million received Ritalin for ADHD. And some of these children were as young as two years old. At the same time, up to 60% of elderly people in the UK and US institutions receive uh, antipsychotics off-label for numerous indications, including anxiety, insomnia, depression, dementia, hallucinations. And not only did these drugs produce severe side effects, but a recent placebo-controlled study here in the UK showed that they actually increased the death rate in patients with dementia. And the cost of these prescriptions in England was 80 million uh, pounds a year. And doctors over prescribing 
has led to some tragic results, such as prescribed drugs entering the illicit drug scene. Benzodiazepines, Ritalin, and other stimulants, some antipsychotics and antidepressants are now taken illicitly by mouth, navel, nasal snorting, or injection, with all the risks of heroin or cocaine injection. And a recent survey in Merseyside showed that the lifetime prevalence of illicit Ritalin use was 31% among young people. And furthermore, we are polluting rivers and streams from drugs or the metabolites which are flushed down the toilets with ecological consequences to animals and men. And the medical profession should take much responsibility for allowing the present situation to arise. They've been too easily persuaded by the drug industry and have been guilty of decades of thoughtless prescribing, muddled thinking, and blank acceptance of propaganda. For example, they should have been aware of the addictive potential of benzodiazepines and the withdrawal effects from antidepressants. There was plenty of literature available at the time, and there were already unheeded voices crying in the wilderness. There's been a lack of training in clinical pharmacology and in the management of drug withdrawal. Medical students today get minimal training in clinical pharmacology, yet every doctor prescribes drugs. Listening to patients has become a lost art. In the present system, GPs are allowed only 10 to 20 minute appointments of which the patient is only allowed to voice one complaint. Uh, and if they've got two complaints, he has to book two appointments. And yet it was patients, not doctors, who observed drug addiction with benzodiazepines and withdrawal symptoms from antidepressants. So doctors have also been seduced by the idea that drugs are the cure for mental illness. There's little research into the underlying causes and prevention. It's very hard to get a grant now in universities for research that explores new and original ideas which don't have an immediate application or clearly lead to a defined lucrative outcome. Yet it's basic research that leads to scientific breakthroughs. And there have been no breakthroughs in mental health in the last 50 years, just innumerable drug trials. But do we really need more drugs for anxiety and depression without knowing their basic causes or prevention? So it seems clear that money, not science, is driving pharmacology. And yet, the drug companies are the only ones with funds to conduct large trials and to develop new drugs which can and have saved many lives. We need and depend on the drug companies. But doctors and drug companies should work together to ensure that valuable drugs are available to people who might benefit. This doesn't happen now, partly because drug companies don't provide full information and hide or obscure some of the information which they have. There are also failures in the political system under which we operate. So what can be done about this? Well, one measure we could take is to separate the pharmaceutical industry from healthcare policies. In 2005, the House of Commons Health Committee issued a report uh, entitled The Influence of the Pharmaceutical Industry. And this report stated that the Department of Health has for too long assumed that the interests of health and the drug industry are one. In practice, the industry affects every level of health care, from the licensing and promotion of new drugs to the compilation of clinical guidelines. The same department, indeed the same minister, responsible for negotiating NHS drug prices, is also responsible for ensuring that NHS drug spending is sufficient to keep the industry profitable. So the Health Committee wisely recommended, among other things, that the sponsorship of the drug industry should pass to the Department of Trade and Industry, while the Department of Health should concentrate wholly on public health. 
And this seemed like a sensible recommendation, but the government rejected it. So the situation is much the same. And finally, the public, that is all of us, need to keep up the pressure on, authorities, uh, on the authorities and publicize what we see and hear every day from patients and healthcare workers. I don't think the powers that be who set government targets about hospital turnover, waiting lists, NHS spending, and who have appointed so many man administrators, I don't think they have any idea what goes on in the lives of individuals and their families who, through failures of the system, are driven to seek advice from voluntary organizations and to obtain information from conferences like this one. So I think the patients should treat their doctors more like garage mechanics who service their cars. And if they are prescribed a drug, they should ask questions like, do I really need this drug? How does it work? Etc. And I think there's a list of 10 things to ask before you take a drug in the uh, handouts. So, in the words of the anthropologist Margaret Mead, quote, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing it ever has. So perhaps this group of thoughtful citizens here will help to change the world a little. Thank you.